we're going to uh, start a new series, Knowing the Enemy, and it looks like we're, we're going to be spending most of the time in uh, uh, the book of Peter, First and Second Peter, uh, letters, I guess, of uh, Peter. And so tonight is going to be somewhat of an, of an introduction. Thank you. And uh, we're going to pretty, pretty much look at all of the, all of the letters, First and Second Peter, uh, just to make an introduction, and then uh, uh, starting next week, we'll get in a little bit more into knowing the enemy. Okay, all right, I said all that. I think I was just stalling to get set up here, so now <laughs> we're ready. And if you turn to First Peter, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and pray and get started. Lord, we love you uh, so much, and once again, come before you. We don't want to just uh, uh, say it in vain, but, but we thank you for all that you've done for us, and we do love you. We do ask for your blessings on this service and on this church, and uh, we thank you for the week we were able to have at camp and, and building on these young lives, Lord, that we, we hope to see continue and to stay firm and, and the very things we're talking about tonight, Lord, fighting the enemy and, and uh, uh, being faithful to the Lord. Uh, we, we ask that you would help us to instill those things in, the, in our young people. Uh, Lord, as Vacation Bible School is coming up and we have opportunity to minister, minister to Many young people, I pray that you'll just bless that, give wisdom and strength and ability. And, uh, and uh, once again, we ask for your healing on those that are sick. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, I keep mentioning that in my prayers, and I keep, but I keep forgetting to, uh, to share it with you all. All day long, I've been saying I need to talk about Brother Sheldon. And so uh, if you haven't been praying for Brother Sheldon, pray for him. He's... he's uh, just constantly in pain right now, and he's got a, I don't know how much has been shared, uh, but he's got a mass that was found on, on his, in, in his vertebrae or his ribs? Spine. Uh, spinal cord. Uh, and it's actually uh, kind of eroding uh, those, the bones there, and, and, uh, and so that's why he's constantly in pain, but besides that, the doctors say it looks pretty suspicious, could be malignant, so they're going to do a biopsy on the ninth, and uh, and we're just praying that the Lord. I mean, we know that He has the power to uh, to heal them or to take that out of there, and, and when they remove it, uh, whatever has to be done, that He would just be able to re, uh, recuperate and and all. And I know that Mrs. Ruth would appreciate your prayers for her and for him as well. So I keep forgetting to mention that, but please, please remember that. Um, and. Bathe that situation in prayer. Okay, First Peter. I love this. I, it just seems like I always go back to First and Second Peter. And I remember one time preaching a message here not too long ago, uh, where I was in Peter, and I said, "Man, I just always come back to this. It seems to be my uh, my go-to. I don't know why, uh, but in you know a while back, thinking through some possibilities of what the Lord might have me to to preach." I remember thinking of Second uh, Peter where it talks about adding to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge. And, and I thought of a, a, of a direction of going that way and focusing on those things. But then I got away from that and somehow I got led to the, uh, the idea of knowing the enemy. And, uh, and I won't go into all the details of, of how I felt like the Lord was leading my path there. But guess what? It ended right back up in Peter again. <laughs> and so, uh, and then at the... Uh, Junior camp, we, Valerie and I were asked to uh, teach at the, uh, uh, they, they have a s session where they break up the boys and the girls and they just have different pastors uh, bring the lesson to the kids. And so I bring a lesson, brought a lesson to the boys and she brought a lesson to the girls on focus and he used that exact text in 2 Peter 1. And so I, had, I was kind of forced to study that again and, and, uh, and I'm going to share it with you a little bit here in a little bit. What I told the, what I talked about to the, to the children, but it's like the Lord just keeps bringing me back to this, and so hey, that's where we're going to camp out uh, for a while and see what the Lord does. But we'll probably be in other places too. But what, here's what we're talking about: knowing the enemy. And tonight, what I want to talk about is realizing which side we are on. Now, you might, that might sound kind of, kind of weird. Of course, we know what side we're on, but. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right, but against uh, principalities, 
and powers uh, in this world, and of course uh, Satan and demons, and, and that's where our spiritual warfare is. And so uh, there's certainly a spiritual war going on. You know, we sing onward Christian soldiers, and somebody might think of the crusades and think, oh, you know, we're not soldiers, we shouldn't be destroying people or whatever. It's not that, it's just that we are in a battle. In fact, the Bible over and over uses the vernacular how we need to be ready and sober-minded and be watching because we are in a battle and we have a true enemy. But I fear in our, um, maybe not just our society, but in, in Christianity as a whole, it just seems to me like there's a lot of people out there who are just wandering around trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing, where they're supposed to be, what, what side they're on. <laughs> You know who the enemy is, and uh, and they're just roaming around with uh, seemingly without a clue, and these are the people that I feel will never be effective in the battle until they uh, begin to understand who the enemy is and uh, and who they are. Um, I tried to quote this, uh, I think last week when I was mentioning this series coming up, and I I, I had heard it or read it somewhere and I couldn't remember who it was, but. Uh, but it's a book from, from a book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Now, I don't, I'm not recommending This is not a theologian that I want, <laughs> to, uh, want us to study after. But, uh, but here's the, a, a great quote. It goes like this. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. All right, let me read it one more time because this was very influential in this uh, whole thing. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And I, and I know that he wasn't referring to Christianity, but that is very true in our Christian uh, warfare, if you will. Uh, if, you just, if you don't know whose side you're on and what you're fighting for, uh, and you don't know who the enemy is, you guaranteed you're going to succumb in the battle. You know, but if you know who, uh, who your enemy is and you know who, uh, whose side that you're on and all that, then you don't have to fear in the battle. So, uh, so to start the lesson out, uh, the series out, I felt like we should kind of just reaffirm in our mind uh, which side we're on and a little bit about that. Okay, so just three, three things. Uh, number one, we, the human race, uh, if you will, are not all on the same side, okay? That should be a given, but there are a lot of people that I think have a, they struggle with that. Hey, we're all humans. We're all, you know, humankind. We're brothers and sisters, and, and uh, you know, we are the world. We are the children. Hold hands, and that's just, we're going to have to, it, throughout this lesson, as we start discovering who the enemy is, we're going to have to realize that we're not all on the same side, you know, there, there is an enemy in this world, and, uh, and we're certainly uh, not on the all, all on the same side. Um, look at 1 Peter 1, 1, very first uh, verse there. Peter, um, almost all letters start this way. They tell you who, who, there's a few exceptions, but they tell you who the author is, and they tell you who they're writing to, and that helps you uh, uh, understand the letter a bit, a bit better. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Bithynia. Uh, now, <clears throat> I realize that this is talking about what they call the uh, uh, the dysphoria. You know, they're uh, they're talking about the uh, particularly Jews that are scattered about everywhere. And you got to remember that in the early church, it was still primarily Jews that they were going to with the gospel. I mean, even Paul. Uh, though he was specifically going after the Gentiles, he kept coming back to the Jews. And he kept saying, you know, my harsh desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. And he, was, and he, was, he kept going to the Jews. And then Peter was specifically a pastor or a preacher that was dealing with the Jews there. And so uh, 
Uh, so as he's writing this, you can see a little bit of a... Now, there are people that will take this to the extreme and say, yeah, the book of 1 Peter is not to us. It's not to the church. It's to... Uh, I want to just tell you right now, I don't believe that. First of all, I think, I think every book of the Bible can be applied to us and is for us and is profitable for every, every one of us in this room. But not just that, as you begin to read all of these words, we're talking about people who are one in Christ. Uh, you know, we're one body in Christ. And, uh, and, and this is where I get real confused. On the, You remember we talked about how... Uh, uh, God's relationship with Israel was a mystery. We were talking about different mysteries, and we were saying that's a mystery. That's always been a mystery to me. Because I don't know where prophecy regarding the Jews, I don't know how that's all going to come to pass or whatever, but this is what I know. Spiritually speaking, if somebody gets saved, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. You know, there's neither, you're just one in Christ, right? You die, you're going to the same place, <laughs> you know? And if you die without Christ, then you're going to hell. And God, in this text, it even says he's not a respecter of persons. He's not going to just give you a pass because of your, of your race or whatever. And so as I read this, I see it as talking about people who are in Christ. Now, it might have been specifically speaking to, to Jewish uh, people that were converts, uh, but it applies to all of us. And here's what I, I see in that first verse there. They're strangers. Uh, we can go to the book of Hebrews 11, and, and, uh, and there's other, Galatians and other places where it says that we are strangers in this world. We're pilgrims. And that's why we're, this world's not my home. I'm just a passing through, you know. Uh, uh, and, and, and the more you serve the Lord, and the more you grow in knowledge of His Word and everything the more you realize you don't fit in in this world. <laughs> you, 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 you try to uh, fit in somewhat with the culture and whatever, and you're like, whoa, I can't fit in with the culture at all because we are in a, we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. And so, so I like that we're strangers there. If you think that, oh, we're all in this world, we're just one happy family, we're all, that's just not right. That's not true. You should feel somewhat out of place. Christ certainly felt uh, unwelcomed and out of place and a stranger. In fact, he said that they, they're going to hate you because they hated me. And so, uh, so that's going to happen. And the Bible says, all, yea, all who live godly will suffer persecution. So, I mean, there's going to be attacks. There's going to be divisions. There's going to be uh, uh, this sense of, of not, not being at home. Now, at the same time, I want to point this out and make this clear. And I think we can all understand this, but that doesn't mean that everyone that's not like us is our enemy. There are other camps, if you will. And, I, and here's what went through my mind. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad was a Marine. And maybe every branch of the service is like this, I don't know. But if you're a Marine, you think you are the best branch of the service. <laughs> you think you, that you're... You were best. You make fun of the Army people. You make fun of the Air Force people. <laughs> That's just what they were. My dad was a Marine, and so uh, I was a, a big Marine fan. And for some reason, as a little kid, it was almost like the Marines were against the Army, and they were against the, uh, you know, like they were all fighting on separate teams or something like that for a time, you know, in my childhood. It just kind of felt like that. No, my dad's a Marine, and so we're against the Army. No, 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 we're on the same team, <laughs> You know, and we got to remember that sometimes that there's different camps, you know, and, and I can be critical and I don't necessarily think it's wrong to, to use righteous judgment sometimes in dealing with uh, uh, even other churches and the doctrines that they teach, uh, sometimes even the method, methodology that they use. It's not necessarily wrong to, to keep an, uh, an, uh, an open eye and recognize why we don't do some of the things that they do, but that doesn't make them the enemy. Okay, and so if you got a friend, you got somebody who loves the Lord, maybe they don't use the King James Bible. You know, maybe they don't believe a, a, a comp everything exactly the same as you do. Maybe they don't dress exactly the same, same as you do. Now, I'd be careful if I'm going this certain direction that I feel God's, you know, sent me on this path and this person is influencing me away from that. I'd be careful, but that doesn't make them the enemy. Okay, so, uh, so there are those who... Sometimes we feel kind of out of place. We feel like we don't fit 
exactly, uh, but they're not the enemy. They're just, they're, you know, you have to remember that. And then the second thing is, since we're using the, the uh, vernacular of the military, civilians. Civilians are not the enemy. When you're in war, yeah, sometimes there are civilian casualties, I know, but, but when you, you just don't go around looking at all the civilians like, like enemies. Now, you've got to be careful because you don't know who might be the enemy. The same is true, by the way, in, that, in that, uh, the other churches, you know, the other, in other churches where they might have di- different doctrine and stuff. Now, they might not all be the enemy. You've got to be careful, though, because you don't know when Satan's, uh, the ministers are, are revealing themselves as the ministers of light, right? We've talked about that. And so you've got to be always on the guard, always careful. Uh, if I were in battle right now, let's say in the Middle East, you know, I've heard a lot of stories where, uh, well, they give a civilian a bomb, you know, or they'll give them a gun. And they'll just walk down the street and everybody will think, oh, that's a civilian. And then, you know, you find out they've got this bomb or something like that. And so, uh, so but, but for the most part, we've got to remember that we don't just go around and, and, and uh, uh, separate ourselves so much from the world. And we're going to get to that, that word in a minute. Separation is a good thing. And Christians should be separated unto the Lord. But we don't just go separate ourselves so much that it's like, oh, you, you don't go to my church. You're not, you know, you're, you're the enemy. Or even, you know, hey, you don't, you don't believe a certain way. You're the enemy. You don't be, I mean, if somebody came to you and said they're an atheist, that doesn't necessarily make them the, the enemy. Now, they, they could be an enemy, but it could be they just never been properly explained the, the gospel or God's never had to, uh, you know, um, been able to work in, his heart, in their heart like, uh, like we want him to. And, and, and so we got to be careful not to just label everybody as the enemy, but there is certainly... An enemy out there. We're not talking about the enemy today as much, though. We're talking about uh, what side we're on and who our side. First of all, recognize that we are not all on the same side. Okay. Second of all, we are under the leadership of our commander. Uh, it's not like you know we're we're separated from this world. You know we're on our own side, and so we go do whatever we want. No, we have got. A commander in chief. You know, we've got uh, instructions and we've got marching orders. And so the Lord says here in, uh, uh, let's read down in verse 2, the second verse. Okay, so he said that we're strangers. And in verse 2, he says this elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Now, this is one of the things that makes uh, 1 Peter and 2 Peter a little bit hard to understand and to study because they use some of these words and these phrases uh, that we struggle with a little bit. And so that word elect is nothing to be scared of, let me just, let me just say. But, but it's, a, it's a great word, actually, in a, you know, let me come back to that word in a minute and first use another word, and that is chosen. All right? And I'll explain it in a minute. But called out or separated, uh, somebody who is chosen. Now, we're going to come back to the word elect. But look, at, look with me, if you will, to Hebrews. Back a couple chapters here. I mean, a, p- a couple pages in your Bible to he- the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be there yet. Just a second. Okay. uh, Okay. Yeah, this is what I was thinking. Okay. All right. So this word chosen, God chose us. Okay. He called us out. And he, and he separated us. But I want you to notice, uh, hold your place in, I'm sorry about this, but hold your place there in Hebrews. We're coming right back to it. But go back to that, that verse in First uh, Peter. Okay. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, to the, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. What is that sprinkling of blood? That's a weird phrase. Sprinkling of blood. Now, Hebrews, uh, the, the verse I was just reading, uses that same phrase, 
uh, about Jesus in Hebrews 12, 24. It says, uh, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and two, the blood of sprinkling. And then it uses Abel. Better thing, it speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now back up to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, this is known as the faith chapter. It lists all these uh, uh, by faith. You know, Abraham did this and by faith. But the first one it mentions is Abel, which makes sense chronologically. He's the first uh, that, that it mentions. Hebrews 11 verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and, he, and, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. What does that mean? Abel still, still speaketh. Well, if you remember, I don't, I don't have to labor on this very long. I think everybody gets the, the general idea. If you remember, Abel gave a gift that is what God required. It was a blood sacrifice of a lamb. That's what God required. Cain brought the works of the flesh, is what it, rep what it represented. The works of his hand, what he had gathered from, the, uh, uh, from working in the field. I don't know, this thing makes so much noise. And, uh, and so that rep represents the work of the flesh. Whereas Abel's sacrifice, which he just gave by obedience, was, uh, was just the blood of the lamb. And this is what pleased, if you remember the story, pleased God. And he, had ex and he accepted it. And he had favor on that one. And, and then whenever Cain began to complain about it, he said, don't you know you could have done the same thing, basically is what he said, if you just be ob obedient. Fast forward a little bit to uh, uh, the children of Israel getting ready to pass through the, uh, you know, getting ready to come out of Egypt. What does he say? Take blood and sprinkle it on the, door, on the, the post of the door. And all the firstborn of the land are going are gonna to be killed. But whenever the, the angel sees that, that blood on the doorpost, he's going to pass, pass by, right? And so this idea of the sprinkling of the blood, this idea of, of the blood in general, you know, uh, is, is you see it all throughout the Bible, this theme, and it represents being obedient to Christ. And so what does it say? Go back to 1 Peter through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what it's talking about. So, so here's the point that I'm wanting to make with this. I believe what it's saying here is that you are elected by God. And I'm going to get back to that word. But you are elected by God after you enlist. You say, what do you mean? Well, look, Abel offered a sacrifice. The children, the, the Hebrews, they had to obey and put the blood on the doorpost, right? So we're not talking about somebody who God just said, you know what, I elect you, and so you're going to be saved. I don't elect you, so you're not going to be saved. I don't, I don't believe that, okay? I believe everybody had that choice to sprinkle the blood. Everybody had that choice to sacrifice a lamb, okay? That was the picture that was given to us, okay? But... Once you have enlisted, so to speak, into, uh, let's say, God's army, uh, now he's going to assign you. He's going to call you. He's going to separate you unto a certain work that he's got for you to do, okay? So now uh, uh, there's a, you know, between this calling or, uh, se or, or separating, maybe the word select, select and elect are very similar, but... Uh, He'll call you out unto this, and, uh, and, and I'm trying to think here. Let me see. Uh, okay, real quickly, there's several places just in the book, of, just in First and Second Peter alone that uses this word called, so let's look at them for a second. Uh, but here's what I want to show you, that our master, our commander, he is the one who is going to give us the orders, okay? He's called us unto something. So let's look at First Peter chapter 1, verse 15. 1 Peter 1.15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Okay, so what has he called us to do? Well, one thing, he's calling us to be a holy people. Okay, and we'll talk more about that. 
But uh, look at, let's look at chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, let's see here. I'm sorry. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, uh, that ye should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you see, he's called us to give glory to him and to, and to give praises to him, to show forth praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise, contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Okay, He's called us to be patient. You look at this whole context here, not to uh, render evil for evil, but to, uh, there's, so there's a certain lo, uh, uh, way that he wants us to live and a certain way he wants us to be, behave. That's what he's called us unto. Chapter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by, uh, G, by Christ Jesus, after that he hath suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, Settle you. So he's got a plan for our life and he's got a direction that he wants us to take. And interestingly enough, uh, well, let me, let me give you a couple, uh, let's see, two more. 2 Peter 1 3. 2 Peter 1 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain un, unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Uh, virtue has to do with how we live and how we behave ourselves. Okay, he's called us to a virtuous life. Uh, and then uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence, that's work, that's effort, to make your calling and election, there's that word election, sure. Now, what does that mean? Do you need to work to make sure that you're saved? Is that what it means? No, no, it's saying to tighten up some things, all right, to make it secure, to make it sure. Tighten it up, okay, make your calling. God's called you to a work, and you need to tighten things up and do that work that he's called you to. That's what it's saying. It's not saying, it's not indicating in any way you can lose your salvation. And then when it's talking about your election there, it's not in any way indicating that, oh, God, God chose you, you know, and, and he, he sent other people to hell, but he's gonna, he chose you to have heaven. Uh, I don't believe that. Okay, so... Here's the, the great news. 1 Peter 1.5. 1 Peter 1.5. When we enlist into God's army, we have a, him as our master and our commander. He's in charge of our affairs. He's, he's going to make sure that we, uh, uh, do, we, we have what we need uh, to, to accomplish his work. 1 Peter 1.5 says this, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, while back in Sunday school, as we're going through the articles of faith, we talked about the preservation of the saints. And uh, it's this idea that when you give your, when you call on Jesus to save you, essentially you're, and, and the Bible uses the term being born again, you're born into the family, Okay, enlisted in a service, if you will. You're, you're his sheep, is the word that Jesus used. And he says, my sheep know my voice, and they hear me. Okay, that doesn't mean you're perfect. That doesn't mean you're going to always follow him. That doesn't mean you're, you're not going to fall sometimes. In fact, that's what this book of Peter's talking about. Uh, we want to make sure that you, you secure some things, and you don't keep falling. You keep getting up, and you keep doing what you're supposed to do. But he says that, um, but God uh, will keep you and preserve you. Okay, the Bible says over and over we're uh, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, He's going to keep us. And so if you've been saved, you can count on the fact that you, are going, you have eternal life. Okay, that's, you're not going to lose that. But what we're talking about are things that the job that he's given us to do, how are you doing? You know, what kind of advances are you, being, are you making there? Which brings us to the third and final point, and that is this. Not only are we uh, not all on the same side... And not only do we have a leader and a commander on our side, but one day we will give an account after the battle. 
You know, I'd hate to be the kind of guy in war. And I've often wondered, like of all the survivors, you always hear their story. You don't know about the ones that, that died. And, and sometimes you, you wonder about people, even the ones that get like these, these great honor, you know, these great awards or, hey, you, you know, this guy got a purple heart or he got this. Well, you're, you're only going off of their word. <laughs> you don't really know. So I've often wondered in my mind how often this happens. I don't know. But how many of these guys just hid somewhere? <laughs> you know, they just bunkered down and said, I'm not going out there. I don't want to be killed. And after the war's over, they kind of pop up and say, hey, I made it. <laughs> you know, I'm sure it happens. I might be tempted to do it myself <laughs> if I was in that situation. But I don't want to be that kind of person when I stand before the Lord and say, well, I made it. I don't have anything to show for it, but I made it. <laughs> you know, I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, and so, uh, so we have to be, uh, we remember that he has given us a job to do, and we will one day give account for it. Now, this brings me right back to my lesson that I taught at camp, and this is how I'm going to finish up, is by giving you a really quick uh, summary of what I taught the, the young people. Look at Second Peter. I told you I was going to come back to that word elect. Uh, just real quickly, what, let me say about that. I, I never realized that there was, a di- there was necessarily a difference between selected and elected. Uh, but I think it was uh, Franklin Roosevelt that said that presidents are selected, not elected. And I thought, what in the world does that mean? I mean I, what do you mean selected, not elected? And I think this is what he's getting at. He's saying that they select the media the guys in charge, the guys with all the money or whatever, they select who it is you're going to vote for, basically, right, before they're elected. They they already select before they're elected. So there's a slight difference in word here, and uh, and, and here's what I want you to to think about. It's not like God just says, hmm, I'll choose you, you know, and, and you, you know, and now you're on my team or whatever. What the word elect means is he has appointed you to a position. Now, we read that verse that said you are a a royal priesthood. You know, he uses names like that. He says you are kings and you are priests. And he's he's, he's put us into a position. He's, He's elected us into a position, not just selected us, not just called us out, although he did call us out, but I think it goes above and beyond that. And that's what I think the beauty is of that word elect. Okay, that was just a freebie. So here we go, Second Peter chapter 1. Here's what I told uh, the young people. In, I'm, making this, I'm trying to make this real short. And theirs was pretty short too, because they're young people. But I just want to say this. Okay, look in that first verse. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Well, how do you obtain faith? You know, aren't you just born with faith? Well, I think God, the Bible says God gives everyone a measure of faith. I think everyone has it, has the potential to call on the Lord. And to, he talked, a preacher talked about that this morning. He said that, you know, there, he said, I don't understand it all, but I believe that, that nobody's without excuse. Everybody has some form of enlightenment. Uh, that calls them to the Lord, even if they haven't heard a clear presentation or whatever. Uh, so how do you come to faith? Well, that is simply by choosing to put your trust in Jesus and calling on him to save you, right? Uh, we see that over and over in the, in, in the Bible. We're going to start pretty soon uh, Sunday mornings. We're going to go through the book of John, and the title of the series is Believe. And we're going to look at all the places in the book of John that says believe, 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 believe. I mean, that is what... The Gospel of John's written for, really. He even says that, I have written these that ye might believe. All right, and so so how do we do that? What's another word for believe? Trust. Another word for faith. Okay, so what you do is you just come to that faith. You have obtained it, not by works, okay? It's just faith. You've said, okay, well, I can't do anything on my own to deserve going to heaven. I need Christ and his righteousness, and you put your faith that he is your only hope of salvation, then you have obtained like precious faith. You've been born again. You're part of the family, all right? And Jesus says over and over again that at that point you have eternal life, right? 
I believe uh, wholeheartedly that you can't lose your salvation. And uh, you can look at plenty, uh, you can look at all the context here and see over and over again that he has, uh, he is, has, is going to get you to the other side, if you will. Okay, so what I did was, uh, I said, now, we're, so, so Peter is talking to who? He's talking to believers, those who have put their faith in Christ, those who have eternal life. And he says, uh, according to the divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are, the prom are, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, and this is the passage of scripture that always uh, has such an impression on me, giving uh, all diligence. Now again, the Bible says, uh, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? Not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. So can you come to the Lord and to uh, salvation by works? No, definitely not. Faith is, is the gift of God over and over. The free gift of God, even the, the Bible says several times in Romans, uh, that it's a free gift. Does that take a lot of work? That takes no work. But here it says, Besides this, give all diligence. Now that's work. That's hard work. That's effort. Giving all diligence, add to your faith. And then he gives you this list of things. Virtue. Now most of the stuff that we talked about at camp had to do with virtue. Keeping yourself pure. You know, obeying your mother and your father and honoring them. You know, all these things are virtue. Things that you, you uh, are, are good for you to do. Just start, just start working on being a good person and, and, and doing right and, and all these kinds of things. And, and uh, so he says, add unto your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. Like, God wants you to have knowledge. He gave you the Holy Bible <laughs> to read, and he gives you the Holy Spirit to, uh, to bring you to the knowledge the, uh, that's, that's out there for you, and knowledge, uh, temperance, and temperance, patience, patience, godliness, godliness, I think I missed one, but uh, uh, brotherly, kindness, brotherly, brotherly kindness, charity. And so here's what I did. I wrote all these on a piece of paper and said, okay, virtue. And I said, these are like, this is the pathway, okay? I'm over here. This represents faith. I came to Christ by my faith. I have obtained like precious faith with the apostles and, and all. And so now I'm on this pathway for eternity. Okay, over there represents eternity. Well, while I'm on this life, I've got all these things God wants me to get. All right, he's, gonna make it, he, he's not just going to make it real super easy and just give me everything. He's, it's going to take diligence. I'm going to have to work at it. Okay, and it's like buried treasure, really. You know, so you think about you got to just work for it and try and, and, and try your best to, uh, to obtain these things. And along the way, I told the kids, Satan likes to put little things in your path. And so I brought a couple little examples. Uh, this was a big favorite of the kids. That's not chocolate. <laughs> this is a, something that you might find on the path that you don't want to step in. And Satan, make sure there's something in your path. In your path, he might put a, a snake on your path that's going to bite you. And this is represents dog vomit, I guess. I don't know. And so <laughs> I put that on there. And I said, so we were talking about focus. And I was saying that uh, you ever get a try to take a picture on your camera, and it's like it won't focus. It's, it doesn't know what to focus on, so it's going back and forth, and you and you're not. Getting that out. When I'm running on the trail, a lot of times I like to stop and get a picture of a flower or something, and I'm getting real close to it and trying to focus on it. And, and eventually it might get clear, and then everything in the background is blurry, you know. Or to focus in on the background, and it's clear, but whatever I'm trying to get a picture of is blurry, you know, do that. And I said, well, we have to have focus in this, you know, as we're going through and trying to uh, stay focused on what, on what we're doing, because if not, if everything's blurry, we're going to step in something. <laughs> we're going to get bit by a snake. We're going to slip on, on what the obstacles that uh, uh, Satan's putting in our way, right? Why? Well, Satan knows if you're a child of God, he can't take your soul away from you. So what does he want to do? Well, he wants to do everything that is possible to get you to be unfruitful. So look back at our text. Oh, my Bible's here. Let's 
see here. Second Peter, he says, uh, uh, verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Okay, the, the one that can't see, the one that's blind, he's the one that's going to lack these things. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. All right? I already explained that. Tighten it up and, 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 uh, and do what is expected of you, what you've been called to do. For if you do these things, you shall never fail, uh, never fall. Look at verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I used to struggle with that. Because there's always been a group out there that believes you can lose your salvation. And so I used to struggle with that. And, and it looks right here like it's saying you may never fall. Fall, maybe that means you lost your salvation. And then it says, but if you do these things, then you'll enter into a life. I'm thinking, whoa, so we're talking about, you know, you have to work for your salvation. You have to, well, not if you read all the context of the, of, uh, of the letters here, first of all. You can't, there's no way you can read that. But second of all, here's what it says. It doesn't say you enter into life. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you. What's the next word? Abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible says, uh, what is it? Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. I think I wrote it down. Uh, let's see here. I might not have. Um, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look there and we're about to close. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So not only do we, uh, are we not all, all on the same side, and not only do we know that we all follow a leader and a commander who's called us to a certain job, given us uh, marching orders, if you will, but we also will give an account after the battle's over. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, that, by the way, is what we build our faith on. That is our salvation, Jesus Christ. There's no other foundation uh, that you can build upon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. You notice the difference there? Gold, silver, precious stones. These are some pretty nice materials. Wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." You're not in danger of losing your salvation, but don't you want to enter into the kingdom with rewards? Don't you want to enter into the kingdom with the favor of the Lord? Now, look, I can't ever do anything that, that is worthy of, of praise, I mean, uh, compared to God. <laughs> you know, any, my righteousness is as filthy rags. But if I'm obeying and I'm trying to get virtue and I'm trying to get knowledge and I'm trying to get patience and temperance and, and, uh, and brotherly kindness and charity, I'm working on these things with my life. I'm, not, I'm going to enter into the kingdom abundantly and not unfruitful and barren. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. And, and we thank you for the.